come back to numerical methods. We are still in our section on time discretization of stochastic processes. So we have just proven the strong convergence of the Euler scheme. So our section is convergence rate of the Euler scheme. We have looked at the strong convergence of the Euler scheme. So that part here, that part here is now done. And now I would like to discuss the weak convergence of the Euler scheme. Just recall, the uh, Euler scheme means that we are looking at this stochastic process here. So given a time discretization T superscript N I, which is becoming finer and finer as N increases, yeah, or D maximum size, so that actually was the definition in which sense we look at convergence. The size of the largest time interval goes to zero. Uh, so on this time discretization, we look here at this E2 stochastic process, which is the E2 process with piecewise constant coefficients. So mu is evaluated at the previous discretization point and sigma also. So for strong and weak convergence, we just like to prove the convergence rate. So we can drop the superscript N and just look at some X tilde. So the stochastic process we are looking at can be written very nicely shortly. D X tilde mu tilde DT plus sigma tilde DW, where mu tilde and sigma tilde are now stochastic processes. So these piecewise constant uh, coefficients, the mu evaluated at the previous discretization point and the sigma evaluated at the previous discretization point. What I like to prove in this session here is the weak convergence. So, and I just prove the weak convergence order. So we will prove that we have with the Euler scheme order one weak convergence. So I like to prove that. And we already had the remark that weak convergence is the type of convergence that is most relevant to us. Yeah, at least for example, in the application valuation of financial derivatives. So I would like to look here at this um, error term expectation f of x at a given time t for a fixed given time t and a fixed test function at fixed Lipschitz continuous function f. To prove the weak conversions, and the proof is really quite quite nice, I like it, I need Ito's lemma and Feynman cuts theory. So I will shortly recall the two, so just state the two. But uh, I will also give you maybe a short intuition to Ito's lemma and to Feynman Katz's theorem. And having these two, the proof is not so difficult. So we shortly recall some results. Here it's Ito's lemma and Feynman Katz's theorem. So for Ito's lemma, this is here maybe one possible version, say in n dimension. So let x denote an n-dimensional Etos process. So X has component X1 to Xn. So every component is an Eto process. So I have dxi is mu dt plus sigma dw, mu i dt plus sigma i dwi. So now each component has its own mu coefficient, sigma coefficient, and its own Brownian driver. Uh, so I'm writing here the and I mentioned a stochastic process where every process has its own stochastic driver. So there is here a DWI. And for the DWI, I then have a little sub model. I then have the specification that I allow a correlation structure. So DWI, DWJ is rho IJ DT. You can also specify the process in a different form. So say if you have dxi is 
the sum lambda i k d u k, where u k are independent Brownian increments. So this means that you have a vector of a Brownian increment and the sigma, or let's call it then lambda becomes a matrix you know, that maps from the vector of dw to the vector of dx. But this formulation is equivalent. People who followed maybe my lecture on interest rate models know that sometimes one um, form of writing the process is better than the other form but they are equivalent. So now I use here this formulation with um, a correlation matrix. So rho ii is of course one, this is a correlation matrix, uh, the instantaneous correlation of the Brownian increments. But this specification yeah, doesn't play a big role to the Etos lemma. What's happening now in the Etos lemma is that I consider um, a function g from t and x, t the time, x the state space, the image space of my random variable x. So this is a d-dimensional vector, so I can map into a different dimensional space. And I consider the stochastic process formed by applying g to x. So y is g of t and x of t, capital X of t, the stochastic process. So the claim is this is also an Eto stochastic process. So this is a d dimensional Eto stochastic process. So if it is an Eto stochastic process, then I can write the process in the differential form dy. And what Eto's lemma is telling me is how does dy look like? So what are the coefficients dt and dw or dwi, because we have multiple dw's here um, involved, what are these uh, coefficients uh, look, looking like? So Ito's lemma looks a little bit like a Taylor expansion, yeah, cut at a certain point. And the little surprise is that uh, the first order derivative for the y involves the first order derivative of the x, but also um, a second order derivative. Yeah, so this here is just the chain rule. Yeah, it's just the chain rule, but there is an additional term to the classical chain rule, which involves the second order derivative of the g. Okay, so the claim is that dyk, so the case component of my stochastic process y is the time derivative of g multiplied with dt, then the space derivative of g, dgk by dxi, multiplied with the dxi. So this is just the chain rule. But then plus one half the second derivative of g multiplied with the dxi dxj. Okay, so um, the first two parts can already be written in the e to stochastic process form because you can just formally plug in here that the dxi is the mu i dt plus the sigma i dwi. So you see, just formally multiply this out, you have dgk by dxi mu i in front of a dt and dgk by dxi sigma i in front of a dwi. Um, and you see that the i's run here from one to n. So the, the case component of y could have many DWIs, yeah? So it has maybe a mixture of many DWIs, but that's not a problem, it's still an e to stochastic process. Um, so I have to explain what's the part here. And this part here just comes by formal expansion. So I just do a formal expansion. So what does it mean? I just multiply here mu i dt plus sigma i DWI. I just multiply this with the corresponding term mu j dt 
plus sigma j dwj. So I get a mu i mu j dt dt. And then I follow just these rules. Um, a dt dt is zero, a dw i dt is zero, a dt dwj is zero. And the only thing that remains is this correlation term here, dwi dwj, which gives me the whole ij dt. So actually you can immediately see that here you get a sigma i, sigma j, whole ij dt. So you get another coefficient in front of the dt part. And you already know for our log normal process, it was a minus one half sigma squared. Uh, correlation was then one, yeah, it's just one dw that uh, popped up if the G is the logarithm. Okay, so this uh, coefficient here is sometimes also called gamma ij. For example, later in the Feynman cuts, the thing will appear again. So that's Ito's lemma. I can express the uh, Ito process that is formed by applying a function to another Ito process. Maybe this term here, is a bit obscure. Okay, why do we have the second order term? Why is it not just uh, the chain rule? And um, an easy way to get an intuition for why this is happening is, and I, I, I sometimes like doing this, is looking at a numerical implementation. For example, if you approximate the Brownian increment, so my dw part, if you approximate this guy by a Bernoulli distributed increment. So I just introduce now, say a Delta B and the Delta B can be plus square root of Delta T and minus square root of Delta T, each one with probability one half. So Bernoulli distributed a very small experiment. So I just have here that I can go up with a certain probability uh, this one half and I can go down. And I can maybe repeat this experiment. Uh. So if I take the sum of all those moves ups and down, my picture will look like that. So I will go um, up, down, okay, up, down again, or again up. So I always have these small delta B. And we have from the central limit theorem that in the end, the probability distribution that we observe here converges to the normal distribution. So we take the sum of independent increments. So it converges to the normal distribution so you can just consider the sum of these guys as a delta W. Well, that's actually a numerical method to approximate the normal distribution, a one that we have not discussed in our section before, but uh, it's just the binomial trees. So, if you have the intuition in mind that now you can approximate a large delta W by many small delta Bs, um, but actually my Brownian motion is just also the sum of delta Ws. You could just think that you replace the smallest delta W with a delta B. So just consider maybe for a while the approximation that I consider my stochastic process instead of having a delta W, for, for example, in the Euler scheme, it has a delta B. Actually, the Euler scheme with a delta B, yeah, this is also just a numerical method. And with this uh, funny little approximation, you can sometimes get a nice intuition what is going on because you immediately see the properties of the delta B uh, point-wise. The expectation of the delta B is just zero, like for the Brownian motion, expectation of delta W is zero. And 
the variance of the delta B is just the delta T uh, because I take delta B squared uh, and delta B squared is the delta T in both events. Uh, so I get delta T with probability one. So the interesting thing is that actually I have this here really point-wise while actually for the Brownian increment, it's expectation delta W squared is, de is delta T. So that's maybe the nice simplification. So now let's look what happens if I have a function. So now that's the Etos lemma situation. I have a function G, an arbitrary smooth function that has a Taylor expansion. Yeah, G of X plus H is G of X plus first derivative times h plus one half second derivative times h squared and so on. And now you consider an Euler step of a stochastic process. So I consider a delta x, but I replace my delta w with the delta b. Yeah. So I consider say an Euler step, delta x is mu delta t plus sigma delta b. Yeah? So my just my small up and down movement approximation. And just do what Ito's lemma would do. Yeah? Just plug in the increment in my function. So just plug in h is delta x. Yeah? So look what, what's happening if I move with the x, to the new, new time point by the delta x, look what is happening if you move from the g to the new time point. So that is a g of x plus delta x. Yeah, you just plug in the h is delta x. So g of x plus delta x. So you get here a g of x times first derivative times delta x plus one half second derivative times delta x squared. Okay. And now you can explicitly calculate what is delta x squared. So delta x squared is this stuff here squared. So it is mu squared times delta t squared plus mu times delta t times sigma times delta b is actually twice plus sigma squared delta b squared. So what we have is sigma squared delta b squared gives me a sigma squared delta t. Then the mixed term is a delta t times delta b. Yeah? So this is an, a plus or minus it goes either up or down, a two mu times sigma delta t to the power of three and a half. It goes up or down. And the mu squared delta t squared is a mu delta t squared. So, and you see that this here is the guy that corresponds exactly to Ito's lemma, the delta b squared from the second order from the convex part of the g in gives me explicitly a delta B squared and delta T. So I have that the change in the G, say my delta G, okay, so this here is my delta G, the move, the change in G is, is okay, I subtract the G of X, DG by DX delta X plus one half, second derivative of G sigma squared delta T. So I get this part here. And then I have some higher order terms. Okay, so I don't care. Everything that is larger than or has a higher exponent than one for the delta T, you know, I, I put in there. So you see that you get in this little time discrete analog, you get exactly this term, which corresponds to the term from Ito's lemma.
Okay, so that's maybe a nice exercise to get some intuition. Yeah, this is a finite dis difference version of Ito's lemma. The next thing I need is Feynman Katz theorem. And while Ito's lemma is looking at the stochastic process evolving forward in time and gives me also for the function now, G of this stochastic process, the evolution forward in time, Feynman Katz tells me something if I go backward in time. So let's say notation X denote a stochastic process. So X is a D-dimensional Ito process, X1, 2, X, D. Yeah. D X i is mu i dt sigma i d w i. I also have here the correlation structure behind d w i is d w i d w j is rho i j d t. So it's the same specification as before. Then I look at the solution V of the following partial differential equation. So when this partial differential equation goes backward in time, or you can think of it as going backward in time, because here I prescribe a final condition. So there is a function phi yeah, given at the final time. Okay. And now I consider the PDE dv by dt plus, and now the coefficients from the stochastic process somehow pop in. So I have here the mu as a coefficient in the PDE on the first derivative of the V, dV by dxi. So it's mu i, you know, the coefficient in the dt part that corresponds to the xi, dV by dxi. And I also have a coefficient in front of the second derivative. So for the second derivative, it is gamma ij, second derivative of v dxi dxj. Yeah? So one half of the second derivative sum over all possible uh, second derivatives. Uh, so it's a symmetric matrix. Then you, know, you count every element one half. Okay, where the gamma ij actually are exactly the sigma i, sigma j, rho i j. Yeah? So this corresponds to the coefficient that we get in the Ito lemma in front of the additional dt part that comes from the second order dxi, dxj. So to some extent, all those guys here are associated with a time change, with a time derivative. There is the time derivative of the function V. And for the stochastic process, I have the coefficient that tells me how the process changes in time multiplied with the function, how it changes. But also I have this second order coefficient, the sigma, because I know that if I plug this into a function, uh, then this can create an additional dt term. And this additional dt term has exactly this coefficient, gamma ij. And this should be equal to zero. Um, if you actually move this stuff here yeah, to the other side, then you see that the way the function v changes in time is associated with the way the function v changes in space. Yeah, by the coefficients that describe how the stochastic process changes in space if time changes. So this is a funny PDE. Yeah? It looks very much linked to the stochastic process. And the result is that 
the solution of this PDE is really a lot associated with the stochastic process. It is just the conditional expectation of phi evaluated at X of capital T. So I have a con conditional expectation. So there is a time little t here. So maybe I draw here a time little t. Okay. Then I start conditional to the point X. So maybe this here is my point X. Okay. So conditional that my stochastic process starts there. I look at phi. I look at phi of x of t. So what is phi of x of t? It means that I start here and I evolve the stochastic process. So maybe my stochastic process has now created different values that have this distribution. And then I evaluate the function phi for these values and take the expectation. So you see that I take now the expectation, not some large values, some small values. So what would the function look like? Well, if you move now this distribution up and down for different axes, so let's move the X here a little bit up and down such that I get here a function of little x, yeah. So you see that you take always the average of your function phi, right? You always take the average. You are actually smoothing, yeah. It's like an uh, like a local. Uh, actually, it's like a kernel, yeah. <laughs> it's just a kernel. So yeah, uh, just smoothing the function. So if this function phi has here, say, a very steep steep way of going down, the function v of t and x, which I'm looking here, is maybe much smoother. Huh? It will see changes much earlier. So it's maybe much smoother. So the claim is that the solution of this PDE is actually this conditional expectation of phi evaluated at X of capital T conditional that the stochastic process started in T and X. So the Feynman cuts theorem goes here backward in time. Yeah, so as I mentioned there, yeah, you go backward in time. Of course, you can now repeat this and go further. Uh, yeah, maybe we can also look at this here again, yeah, in a bit formulas uh, to get in intuition for the Feynman cuts theorem. So this is to some extent what I just have drawn. Okay, let's consider a discrete time step, say from the final time, that was my time capital T to a previous time, say little t, which is my t, capital T minus delta T. So I go time step delta T, yeah, backward. Consider for that the change of the stochastic process. So I just consider the change of the stochastic process with an Euler step, delta X. So I have delta X of T is mu of T delta T plus sigma of T delta W. My little T is now the point one time step before the final value. And since the V at the final time is prescribed by the phi and the X of capital T is the X of little t plus the delta X, I can actually rewrite this conditional expectation so I start with X of little t and I have here phi of X of capital T. So the phi of X of capital T is just the V of capital T. So this is just evaluating V of capital T at 
x plus delta x. Okay, so this is actually the same just as the number 19, yeah? That the v at the previous time for a given x is the expectation of the v at the final time evaluated at x plus delta x, yeah? That the final value of the stochastic process. So this is just the situation of the Feynman cuts theorem for now a discrete time step. No, this is just the number 19, uh, where I just approximate my stochastic process with the Euler scheme. And now let's do the same thing as we did for the Etos lemma. Uh, consider just a Taylor expansion for the V and plug in the stochastic process. So if you have a Taylor expansion for the V, it means I now do expansion in state space X, no? so not in time, in state space X. So V of capital T observed at X plus H is V of capital T observed at X plus first derivative times H plus one half second derivative times H squared and so on. So and now I plug in for the H my Euler's gap because my values change from X to X plus delta X. So you see that the H just becomes here the delta X. And on both sides are random variables. So I just take expectation. So what happens if you take expectation left and right? So if you take expectation on the left, this is just what my Feynman cuts theorem tells me that this is my conditional expectation, conditional that I started in little x. So this will be the V of T and X. So this guy here is not a random variable. So this will just stay. Yeah? Also that all these guys are evaluated at capital T. Yeah? They, they just stay. But this guy here, the delta x, okay, this becomes a mu delta t plus sigma delta w, taking expectation sigma delta w, yeah, this will just be a mu delta t. And this here will be just a sigma squared delta w squared, which is a sigma squared delta t. Okay, so you see that you get a mu delta t here and a sigma squared delta t here. Yeah? So change in space translates to change in, in time. So that's here taking expectation, the delta x term becomes a mu delta t, the delta x squared term becomes a sigma squared uh, delta t. And this is a finite difference version of my PDE. Yeah, because now you can divide by the delta t. You can maybe move that guy to the other side with a minus. And you have that this guy here is actually t plus delta t. And then you just divide by the delta t. Okay, and you see that this here is a finite difference version, a finite difference of the dt derivative, dv by dt. So, going back, what with this conditional expectation, the function that we started with here has a certain change in its dependency on the X coordinate. Yeah? And this change is actually then described here by this PDE. So maybe now you have a nice intuition for the Feynman cut theorem. Okay, so we have two ingredients now, Ito's lemma and Feynman cut theorem. Ito's lemma somehow describes how 
a function of a stochastic process evolves as Ito process forward in time. And Feynman cuts describes if we look at the conditional expectation process, so going backward in time, conditioning, yeah, then, um, yeah, if you have multiple time steps, these conditions are all conditional expectation due to the tower law. You know? So you can just combine if you have multiple time steps. Then we know how this evolves backward in time in terms of a PTE. So I like to use these two for proving weak conversions of the Euler scheme. So this is here my theorem, weak conversions of the Euler scheme. I assume that the initial value is deterministic. Uh, mu and sigma are sufficiently smooth. Yeah? So in the end, I need two estimates uh, derived from mu and sigma. And the result is that my Euler scheme approximation converges to the true solution of the SDE with weak order one. So weak order one means that I can bound expectation with the Lipschitz continuous function f, f of x of t. I can bound the error of this expression by a C times H to the power of one. So the term I have to look at is here the expectation F of X of T with this Lipschitz continuous function F, my test function F. So how do we prove this? Okay, so the term I have to look at is the expectation of f of x of t. And now I consider the guy that appeared in the Feynman cuts theorem. I do not consider the expectation, I consider the conditional expectation, conditional that x of little t is equal to x. So I have the same picture. Here at the final time, there lives my function f, yeah, whatever the function f looks like. And I start at a point little x and evolve my stochastic process. So this is here my, my dx. And then I look at the conditional expectation of the values I observe here at these points. I know that I can apply now the Feynman cut theorem. So I have that this function u fulfills my PDE. So du by dt is, or du by dt plus mu, du by dx plus one half sigma squared, second derivative of u with respect to x is equal to zero. And now comes a very funny trick. Uh, I would like to look at this term here for the true solution. So the x, of capital T, yeah, the X being the true SDE. And for the Euler scheme approximation, X tilde of T. So what I do is I will plug in for the X here, the conditional, the Euler scheme approximations. Let me maybe just copy the picture.
So we calculate here the conditional expectation of this stuff. And I consider this now. for x being a value generated by the Euler scheme. So this means that I generate here the values using my Euler scheme approximation. Maybe this x here. Okay, you know that the Euler scheme doesn't look like a piecewise constant, yeah? You already know that now because we had this nice session where we looked look how the Euler scheme truly looks. But I draw it like this just for didactical reasons. So you see that on the left-hand side, there's something different going on. So I generate these values here. I generate these values here using the Euler scheme. Uh, first, this here is a real number. Yeah, this here u t of x is a real number because it is just an expectation. It is a conditional expectation. So it is a function of x, but it is a real number. If I now plug in a random variable for this x, then u of little t and capital X tilde will be a random variable. Of course, it is the random variable that you see here. You start in this point, so this point here is the, is the omega, yeah, the path where you arrived here, this is the omega. And then you calculate from this point, say you calculate the stochastic process. Okay, maybe the stochastic process here looks like that, uh, which generates a certain distribution and you calculate the conditional expectation of the function f. So it is a random variable because it depends where the point ended in time little t. So, Consider this for little x being x tilde of little t. Okay, that's a, that's a funny idea. So what is this? So we are considering u of t and x tilde, we have the capital of little t. Yeah? And note, this is a random variable. So a funny thing is happening if you now move the little t a bit. If you move the little t, say to, uh, how should I say? So if you move the little t, say all the way to zero, then it means that the blue stuff is vanishing and I just start at the initial value. But the initial value of both stochastic processes is the same. If I move to zero, then this becomes just the unconditional expectation of f of capital X of t. Let's write that down. Little t equal to zero. The u of little t and x tilde of t. So this guy here, this random variable, becomes expectation f of x of t. So this is exactly the term in my convergence order error estimate that represents the true value. What happens if the t moves to the other side? So now I move to the final time, capital T. It means that I just create all the values up to the end with the Euler scheme, and then just take the conditional expectation, conditional that I know the value x is equal to little x. So I just take the value itself. So in that case, the u of little t x tilde of t is, well, I arrive at the point x tilde of capital T and I evaluate the function at this point and take the expectation, but this, this point is conditional to the final time. I mean, the conditional expectation is just doing nothing. Yeah? The distribution is DR delta if you would like. 
So it's just the f of x tilde of capital T. So it is still a random variable. Yeah? So I mentioned this object here is a random variable. It becomes the, the an deterministic value. Yeah? It's an adaptive process. Yeah? So if I move to t equals zero and it becomes this f of x tilde capital T if I move to the other side. So if I just then take expectation of this, Yeah. Okay. Taking expectation of expectation doesn't change anything, but taking here expectation of this guy will create here also an expectation. So this is now a nice thing. Yeah. I have the function u of little t x tilde of little t. And if I take the expectation of this and I vary the x uh, and I vary the little t, then this will vary between the true value of expectation f of x of t and the approximate value, so expectation f of x tilde of t. So this is exactly interpolating between the two values. And the nice thing is that I have here a stochastic process. So, what I can do is I can look at how is this stochastic process changing over time. This is the du. And the error I'm interested in is the integral over this du. So integrate from zero to capital T du. Actually the expectation. But um, so how does the du look like? And this is where the next ingredients comes in, it is Ito's lemma. Because u is a function of a stochastic process. And I know the evolution of this stochastic process. So I can apply Ito's lemma to this guy here. Okay, so now if we apply Ito's lemma, to the function u of little t x tilde of t. u was taken from Feynman cuts, plug in the Euler scheme approximation, apply Ito's lemma, and note that the second argument is the Euler scheme approximation. So if you apply Ito's lemma, the coefficient from Ito's lemma will now be the tilde coefficient. So we will have that du of x tilde is a du by dt, this is now Ito's lemma, plus a mu tilde du by dx dt plus and so on. Yeah. So important thing is that since you do Ito's lemma with an x tilde inside, the coefficient that appears here in front of the u is the coefficient from the Euler scheme, my mu tilde. So I will get a mu tilde here in front. So this here is just Ito's lemma. So, I have Ito's lemma for the du. And I know that integrating du from zero to capital T is the upper bound evaluated minus the lower bound yeah, evaluated. So it is u of capital T x tilde of T and u of zero x tilde of zero. Yeah, but I know that these guys are already this one and that one. So if I take the expectation of this, you know, ex taking expectation of the difference is like taking the difference of the expectations. This thing is my weak convergence 
error term. So I have an integral from zero of t and um, underneath there is all the stuff that comes from Vito's lemma, yeah? du by dt, du by dt, du by dx, du squared by dx squared. And with the coefficients, mu tilde and sigma tilde. But now remember that u was the function that fulfills the Feynman cuts PDE, yeah? so the Kolmogorov backward PDE. So I know that du by dt has a certain relation to du by dx and du by dx squared. Yeah? I know that du by dt plus mu du by dx plus one half sigma squared d squared u dx squared. So I know that if I would have here the true guys, then all this stuff here would be zero. So you can actually replace here that du by dt by a mu du by dx plus a one half sigma d squared u dx squared, but always a minus. Yeah? So I have that g u by dt is minus mu du by dx minus one half sigma squared d squared u by dx squared. But now it's mu and sigma from the original STE because u is the solution of the Feynman cuts with the original STE. So if you plug this in, this guy is replaced and these become the differences of the coefficients, the Euler scheme approximation mu tilde minus the true SDE uh, coefficient mu evaluated at x tilde. Yeah? So note that here inside I'm evaluating at x tilde. And the same for the sigma squared, yeah, the Euler scheme coefficient minus the true SDE coefficient. I still need to take expectation, right? I still can take here expectation of all the stuff, which means I also take expectation on the right-hand side. So you see this here is just a martingale, yeah? So expectation of this here is zero. So you are just left with this part here. Expectation of integral from zero to T, the difference of the coefficients. Okay, and that's something you know, that we can nicely estimate if the coefficients are smooth enough. So taking expectation yeah, and recalling that we have here these nice terminal values. So if the time moves all the way to the final time, it's F evaluated at the Euler scheme approximation. If the time moves all the way to the starting part time, it's expectation of F evaluated at the true SDE. So then I can estimate my error term. Okay, and to resolve that my mu tilde uh, is defined uh, piecewise on these intervals, you can maybe also just write here the integral as a sum of these partial integrals. Yeah? And you know that you can now replace here the mu tilde by, okay, so from ti to ti plus one, this here is just the ti x tilde of ti, yeah, on this interval. 
and the same here. So this is the sigma ti x tilde of ti squared on this interval. So you see the time differs by the time step size and yeah, the evaluation time of the uh, stochastic process yeah, is the same stochastic process. It's just the Euler's stochastic process also differs just by the evaluation time. Yeah? So there's no X involved here, the capital X. Yeah, to conclude, yeah, you can now just estimate these two guys. Yeah, we have continuity. Uh, Lipschitz continuity for the coefficients. So we get a C times H yeah? and then we are, then we are just done. Yeah? This integration gives me again, just a capital T, a constant, and I have strong convergence order. Uh, we can, sorry, and I have, I have V convergence order one. So that was, the proof of the weak convergence. And that was it for today. Thanks.